This is actually the first exhibition of what we hope to be an annual exhibition of picture book art. And the next one is um, going to be here next May, and it's called Page Turner's Award-Winning Art from the Maza Museum, which is in Finley, Ohio, which is a great place and a great source of picture book art. So hopefully you'll join us then, too. Um, I want to extend my appreciation to all of our presenters for agreeing to participate in today's discussion, and also to Stuart McKissick, who is right over here, who really um, is the head of the illustration department at CCAD and helped put this program together. And we had a lot of fun doing that, and hopefully you'll enjoy the results. Um, all of our panelists are first-rate children's book artists or aspiring children's book artists. And they're going to introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, but first, I have the pleasure of introducing Michael J. Rosen, who is today's moderator. And Michael is truly a Renaissance man. He's an award-winning author, poet, humorist, editor, playwright, philanthropist, dog lover, and chef, with a great deal of experience in the world of children's book illustration. In addition to many successful publications as author and or illustrator, he has edited many books that benefit organizations that fight to end children's hunger and that support animal welfare. The New York Times cited his efforts as an example of creative philanthropy. The art from one of these projects, children's book illustrators brag about their cats, is in our Imagine exhibition, as well as the art from A School for Pompey Walker that Michael wrote and Amina Robinson um, illustrated. Michael also served as the literary director of Thurber House here in Columbus for almost 20 years. And his most recent book is The Forever Flowers, which I have here somewhere, um, which he wrote and is beautifully illustrated by Sonia Don Donowski. And that reminds me that following um, our discussion today, we will have a book signing. We have some wonderful books. Um, this is Ann Kennedy's. She'll talk about that, I'm sure. Michael Rosen and some from um, Christopher Canyon. So you, we can, you can purchase those in the shop, and then I'm sure um, our artists will be glad to sign them. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Michael Rosen, who's going to introduce our panelists. Um, here's how we'll do this afternoon. Um, there are four guests that will address that question. OK, you saw the exhibit, or you will see the exhibit. Here's this beautiful art, all without words, for the most part. How did that come to be? And was it simply um, a natural act of talent? You know, they just came that way. Magical, poof, here's a finished book. So the first presenter will be Christopher Canyon. Um, He'll be followed by Ann Kennedy, and then Christopher Payne, followed with uh, our CCAD representative, Hannah Ross. And thank you. Christopher Canyon. Hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> uh, great to see uh, so many folks come out here today for this uh, special occasion, especially a great showing from our uh, CCAD uh, student body and staff and lots of other friends that uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing along the way as being a creator of picture books. Um, I'm going to do this in like three minutes, right? Three minute retrospective here. Uh, I've been illustrating picture books for about 20 years now and uh, went to CCAD where I met my lovely wife, Jeanette Canyon, who's also a children's picture book uh, illustrator. Um, but just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of kind of where my interest started um, as an illustrator, it mainly came from my childhood growing up on a farm here in central Ohio. And uh, that's where I really, you know, had a, developed a, a great affinity to nature and the environment. And so that, of course, very much fed into my art that I first presented to publishers um, 20 years or so ago when I started um, sharing my work <coughs> with publishers. <coughs> This uh, kind of nature and wildlife art uh, that I was doing at the time led to a number of nonfiction picture books, mainly dealing with nature and the environment. The work that kind of goes into this sort of accuracy, you know, really depends upon a lot of research. And that's something that uh, folks are kind of surprised to learn if, if, if one doesn't illustrate nonfiction. Just the tremendous amount of research that actually goes into 
having to know exactly what these things look like in order to depict them uh, accurately and thoughtfully and artistically at the same time. Uh, and so sometimes the research that I've done uh, with some nonfiction work uh, can be done in my backyard watching squirrels and drawing and painting lots of pictures of them. Sometimes uh, the animals or the subject matter uh, takes place all around the world in different places. So um, this is from a book that I illustrated a number of years ago called Wonderful Nature, Wonderful You, which uh, has animals from all over the world. And so a lot of the work that I did, the research that I did for this particular book was done at the Columbus Zoo and other zoological uh, studies along the way. <clears throat> Uh, all these books kind of led me to illustrating more and more books about nature and natural places. This is a scene from a book that I illustrated about the Grand Canyon. Um, much of my research was done at the Grand Canyon, doing um, lots of field work, lots of sketches, um, lots of studies, and then this work was created uh, back here in my studio. <coughs> um, I work in a lot of different mediums and styles. This is a, a scene from a book that I illustrated called Stikine, which is a nonfiction book about the naturalist John Muir. So m this story took place uh, back in the 1880s in Alaska. And so the historical type of research that goes into creating a period piece like this, uh, spent a lot of time spending at libraries looking at photographs, uh, <laughs> rounding up models and things like that. Uh, but just really kind of getting into uh, the, the, the whole story, not just the narrative itself, but you know, it's when illustrating nonfiction, and especially historical nonfiction, you have to not only be able to, to draw these things, you have to know exactly what they look like. And so there's a tremendous amount of, of research that goes into creating the visual uh, story that is accompanying the text. Uh, this is another scene from that book. This is a, a dog who modeled for me. <clears throat> her name was Sweetie. When the book came out, the fame did not go to her head or anything. Um, <clears throat> And so these, uh, these, these books kind of led me on a lot of different adventures um, around the world, actually. I, I was out of the North American market for a few years creating some picture books that were published in Japan and throughout Asia. And um, all of these influences were, were wonderful experiences, but I've always worked in a lot of different ways. Uh, after I finished this book series, I, I needed to take a little hiatus. Um, and I wanted to do some other things because I'd, I'd always worked not only in, in nonfiction but also in very fictitious kinds of ways. Uh, so I needed to take a break and um, it was at that time that a wonderful opportunity was provided for me to adapt and illustrate some of the songs of John Denver as children's picture books. I'm a musician, music was the first love in my life and so this kind of set me on a, on a whole different course about 10 years ago. Um, and this is the first uh, song of John Denver's that I adapted and illustrated as a picture book. Um, this one was a real turning point in my career because it, it brought together for me um, kind of a whole experience of illustrating composition, not just the visual composition of creating the illustrations, but the literal composition, of course, of the lyrics, and then, of course, the musical composition. And so bringing all these languages of composition together in ways to kind of um, uh, share a whole experience relating these types of ideas um, in my own kind of way was a real turning point for me. It was the thing that brought together my love of music and love of literature. And so this book series actually kind of gave me the opportunity uh, to do that. Um, it was also very important to keep these books very child-centric. It could be very you know, easy to you know, take John Denver's greatest hits and try to turn them into picture books, but there had to be something about the lyrics uh, that were, were child-centric enough and adaptable enough that I could do something of quality, not only with the artwork, but that these books would be very child-centric. And um, so uh, this led me onto lots of adventures, working in many different ways and many different styles. And over the past 10 years or so, every book that I've illustrated has been pretty much in a completely different style with a completely different approach. Um, this is from Take Me Home Country Roads. Kind of took an augmented approach to illustrating this book. The, the words are not about a family reunion in the song, but creating pictures to kind of share that idea. Different types of narratives that, that illustrators think about uh, from, from, from a visual point of view, whether you're illustrating something that's very symmetrically uh, illustrated where the pictures are telling exactly what the words are showing, um, or in a contradictive way, uh, can be very fun to play around with. This is what we, be, we would consider to be an augmented way of illustrating a book where the pictures and the words are saying two different things, but together they're creating kind of a, a story or an idea that goes beyond either one of the two. <clears throat> and uh, this is the last picture I'm going to share. A um, little homage to uh, Grant Wood. <laughs> um, and I'll do, I'm going to end with this one. Um, 
So uh, as you can see, I, I, I guess with, with the work that I've done and the work that I seem to be doing from, from book to book, the style can change tremendously, the mediums and all those things. But um, I just thought I would end with this picture just because I had such a good time making it. So I'm done. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ann Kennedy. I was a child prodigy. I landed my first paying job as an illustrator when I was eight years old. From my desk at school, I managed the Ann Vitour shop, which stocked a variety of small stand-up animals, and they ranged in price from two cents to six cents. Let me tell you, they were all the rage. Business was great. I came by this line of work honestly, as art has always been in my family. My great-grandfather, Joseph Vitour, and my grandfather, Robert Vitour, I'm sorry, where are you, Joseph? There we are. And Robert Vitour were both successful muralists who decorated churches throughout the Midwest. Their magnificent work can still be seen gracing altars, walls, and ceilings. But somehow, when I put paint to paper, it comes out as squirrels in pants, or <laughs> hippos in gossamer skirts, or all manner of animals in all manner of dress, or undress. I've been a lifelong animal lover, animals make me laugh, and I've always preferred to illustrate animal stories, and I find them easy to draw. In fact, when I have to draw children, I have to think of them as little rodents in order to get them down on the paper. <laughs> I am self-taught, except for auditing Ben Mahan's wonderful illustration class at CCAD. My process is ever-changing, and I'm always learning on the job. As illustrators, we create under the pressure of a deadline, which is a very special kind of torture. Until quite recently, I always was terrified that the tight deadlines and my lack of formal schooling would reveal that I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> the recent difference is that now I am both author and illustrator and of my own books, and they are wholly mine. Yay! I work with a nurturing editor at Candlewick Press. And this spring, my first Candlewick book was released to great reviews, The Farmer's Away, Ba, Nay. It's typical of my work, active, colorful, humorous anthropomorphism. My books are often born of a single character sketch or an amusing thought. By the time the story is perfected, which can be a surprisingly long process for a children's book, the pictures are already in my head, so the sketches come easily. I choose a palette from collected scraps, and I assign feature colors to each spread of the book. Working from a loose base of color, I add the middle, dark, and light tones. I always create my books to please that little girl who sold tiny paper animals from her desk at school. I create books that I would have chosen to read when I was a kid. And now, it's paying a little better than six cents an animal. <laughs> Next year, my new book will be out in the fall. Ragweed's Farm Dog Handbook is a guide written by a farm dog who thinks he's an expert, but is actually a screw-up as a farm dog. Still, he manages to earn his rewards, and he is loved. I think it might be autobiographical. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, when we talk about children's books and illustration, I didn't enter the business to be a children's book illustrator. I just wanted to be an illustrator. And so I spent most of my career doing that. 
And I, I was a kid drawing all the time, doing caricatures and of my teachers and what have you. And so all I wanted to do was make pictures. And so for a long time in my career, I was doing artwork such as this. And always with the idea that what you want to do as an illustrator, regardless of what market you're working in, you just want to get as good as you can get. That's it. And if you get as good as you can, with some luck, good jobs come their, your way. And for example, like this, I was fortunate enough to do a lot of work for Reader's Digest, advertising, such as this. And when you're doing that, you know, you, different jobs come along the way that, that have different subject matters, whatever it may be. And somewhere down the line, I got to do a children's book, and I won't talk about that one, because when this particular book came along, the editor asked if I wanted to do it, and I said, no, I didn't want to do any more children's books because it was such a miserable experience. <laughs> and it was. It was horrible. And she pleaded with me and said, please, well, I'll work with you. I'll work with you. And so I ended up agreeing to do that. And bless her heart, she was very patient with me, helped me along through it, and it led to having some success with that book while still doing the other work that I was doing. And that ultimately led to doing a book such as these with John Lithgow, which had some notoriety, and more work started to come in. And once again, because of that, then people started seeing what I was doing, and they could see where my passions were. And one of being from Cincinnati, it's baseball. And so I've been able to do a book based on my passions. This is another one here. And I'm at the point now with my work where and probably it's also dictated by my age because the way the editorial market works, it's so tight as far as deadlines. You guys were talking deadlines. Time Magazine would call it Wednesday, and they want the artwork in New York on Friday. And so you're killing yourself. And so as much as these things can be a struggle, at least it's not overnight. It's like nine months, you know, and that's an eternity. And so you end up getting a book, and you storyboard the thing out like this, and I, also being a nut for movies, I feel like not only am I being an illustrator, but I'm being like almost like a movie director to some degree, because I get to cast it, I get to set the shots, I get to set the scenes and move things around. And so you end up doing color studies, and you go out and you do your research, and then you tighten up the drawings for your final approvals, and then you get to work on the finish, get started on them, wrap things up, and if everything works out, you got yourself a children's book. So I've now decided in my career that I'm trying to tell all these editorial clients, I don't want to do any more of that work. And I just want to focus the rest of my career focusing on children's books for two reasons. One, as much as the time covers are seen by 14 million people, the next week they're lining parrot cages. Okay? <laughs> You do a good children's book, that kid reads the book, they appreciate it, they grow up, they have children, they read it to their kids. They last. And they really do have a, a place in people's lives. And so I want to try to do this. And so I'm working on trying to do more children's books, but I don't want my past to dictate my future. And that's one of the things I saw what Chris was talking about, what Ian's talking about. The story tells you how to illustrate this, and this is going to be an upcoming book that will be out in the fall. I um, got to do a version of Tom Sawyer. And Tom Sawyer, when I read the book a number of times, I finally realized, you know, it reads like a journal. So I'm going to illustrate it like a journal. And we'll see what they, how it designs out, how the designer designs it in the end. But I, artists, when they keep journals, they draw with whatever's in their hand that moment. So maybe they add color, maybe it's a sketch, maybe it's a pencil, maybe it's a pen. So I just threw this, the, all these things together in this hodgepodge, but what comes through is the way I draw. And so from this point forward, I'm going to try to do more child, all of my children's books, but I'm hoping down the line you're going to see a lot of different things come from me because Again, I'd like the story to dictate to me what I'm supposed to do rather than me inflict myself into the work. But anyway, that's essentially the story. Hello. I feel like I don't belong here, but that's okay. I'm new and I'm learning. Okay. 
Uh, my name is Hannah. Uh, I'm a senior at uh, CCAD, an illustration major, um, minoring in creative writing. Um, so those are sort of both of my, my loves. Um, I don't have a lot of real world experience in the, in the picture book world yet, but I uh, am aspiring to it. So I'll just kind of go through and show some of my work. Um, pretty uh, heavily inspired kind of by that European New Yorker type, type look, um, editorial. Um, this was actually a project I did for Mr. Payne. Um, and so, I don't know, I've, I've kind of bounced all over the place. I have a very specific way of kind of imagining things and, and my writing and my, uh, the way that I draw kind of both reflect that um, and there's overlap there. Um, okay. um, in the summer, I actually worked uh, as an intern at American Greetings, which is a greeting card company in Cleveland. Um, so that was a pretty amazing experience. Um, and I can actually, I'm not supposed to show anyone some of this stuff, so um, <laughs> don't tell Hallmark. Okay. <laughs> um, so those are some of the things I, I did for them. I don't know what will come of some of uh, some of it, but it's a really interesting experience. Um, this was a cover I did, another pain assignment. Um, so yeah, and and currently I uh, am studying uh, with Christopher Canyon to do to write and illustrate my own children's books. So I'm sort of just beginning this world, um, this path. Um, so it's all sort of new. Uh, new to me, but I, I'm, I'm learning some things <laughs> about the process and about myself. Um, it's, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of time. Um, that's Tigger. Um, uh, and so here's, uh, so I took a picture book class last semester actually uh, with Canyon. Um, and just completely the, the, the process and the, the way that this stuff is done, like, we, we really went through it all. Um, we didn't write our own, our own manuscripts, but we got to go through the, the thumbnail process and the storyboarding and the dummy books, and so having that uh, experience and that kind of um, introduction to, to the world was really, really uh, influential and in, in kind of solidifying the fact that I want to do this. I know I want to do this. Um, so those are some of, uh, of the finals that came from that. And I also realized I have a very different kind of style than everyone else. They're all so real. Um, but there's some of that. And that's some more greeting card stuff. Ooh. <laughs> and that's it. Yay. <laughs> Over the 50 children's books that I've done over the years, only two have started with someone other than me. Meaning usually I write a story or an agent uh, says, you know, I've got an editor interested in X or Y and then I create the thing and they work on it and figure out what needs to change and what needs to be uh, longer or shorter or different. The illustrator then gets the book and we see sketches, we see the process, a whole other world is created around that uh, or within that. This, uh, two years ago, Creative Editions, uh, my editor there said he was at the Bologna Book Fair where uh, the international exhibit where publishers convene and all kinds of people come together from all around the world, obviously, to, to buy books that they could possibly do. And my publisher saw Sonia Danowski's work um, and somehow convinced her she had a done book in manuscript. She'd done all the illustrations, and uh, she'd written a story, and he said, I'd love to publish this uh, in America. Stay tuned. Would you be willing to let someone else write a story? So she basically said, yes, I'll take away the story that I'd written, Sonia speaking here, and I'll let whoever you decide, and I hope I can get an idea of what it is before for sure it happens, and 
So I had this very interesting process where all of the work was done. Originally, I was allowed to ask for two new illustrations and remove two illustrations, but that's not actually how it ended up working. Um, so I had to shuffle like a deck of cards and try to make sense out of a story that I knew basically had to do with a bird that flew and that didn't make it and landed in the water and a dog found her. What was so thrilling to me was discovering this manuscript was like I was a foreign exchange student where I went and lived in someone else's house and someone came and lived in my house. And then when I got back, everything that had happened, well, here were the pictures of it. They were all my things on my land with my dog, not really, but the equivalent of my dog. And I had to make some, some new sense of what artifacts had been created for me. So it was not simply um, giving a story of, you know, pigs that lived in a barn and had an invasion by a vulture, you know. It was a very germane connection to me in my world and was a challenge that was unlike any that I've had, as I suggest before, because it's literally a backwards process. Um, and this was the cover originally. And it gave me so much trouble thinking about a kid's book in which you would have this stoical, cold, you know, melancholy, distant, aloof, none of the words that I apply to kids' books, basically. So I had to come up with a story that would somehow kind of go around it. And so it's all really told from the point of view of the bird, and the woman is never named, the woman is simply the dog's companion. And that was how uh, I was able, even the second appearance of the woman's warmth isn't exactly, you know, beaming here. Thank you.